the sound okay? Is it any issues with that? Yeah, it's it's pretty decent, maybe a little softer. So yeah, let's start the meeting then. So everybody, please take a look at the agenda for today, which is, let me type it in. Let's see, can we have, um, can we have maybe Lex, just since Lex has got to leave, can, can we have Lex uh, start it today? Shane, would you mind? Uh, Lex would need about 10 minutes or so. Um, That's fine. To do it. And you can actually listen in because it's about free CAD, which is relevant work. So, um, main news on my side. So, you can, you can see the development graph. Um, we're going to start picking up. Hey, look at that little uh, on page one here. Let me share my screen. Screen share. Okay, look at our development graph where we keep track of our time. We're going to pick up people. So so I'm ready to spawn the announcement of the immersion program. So I, I worked on it. You can click a link on the um, on page one there, the immersion program. So that's my script for a video that I'm going to put together. But uh, the announcement is for the first time ever, we're offering immersion training so that people can work with us full time. I mean, that's the big deal. We've proven that the extreme manufacturing the workshop model works as a revenue model and we can go forward with that to offer workshops where people uh, do the workshops and about 25 percent of the time or so that would be the the good goal and then the rest of the time is is on research and development and everything else that we do and trying to really scale up the collaborative development processes like looking back at the design sprints the design jams that we've done uh, with some limited success uh, success and learnings uh, but yeah it's about time to to get this all to a higher level including crowd design challenges like hero x integrating that all together as we start building a real team for the first time in project history because of course the continuity issue has been uh, always there as it's hard for people to volunteer when they have a full-time job which is typically the case and people end up quit, quitting over time so I think we're we're gonna start really nailing this in a significant way so still the the development narrative is towards the the September immersion program we're doing all the work required for that which is perfecting the 3d printer Shane's gonna pipe in with the CNC circuit mill which where he's got some excellent results and then working out the filament maker part and a small laser cutter which could produce a very fine small scale micro factory that can do a, just a lot of things a lot of consumer electronics and and other goods that we can set up our little personal micro factories where we're actually earning from that and building a whole ecosystem around that including uh, uh, large collaborative events where we design products like simple products that we simply take to a high quality level like a cordless drill like a like a cell phone like a like a robotic arm or aerial drone I mean all these things can be done so well but there are no great open source versions that are viable products so we really gotta take that open source everything store concept to completion and go from there so uh, talking about collaborative CAD is one of the core tools let's have Lex since he's gotta leave but talk to us so so Lex is working on an OSE dev workbench which allows the uh, the CAD to be collaborative in a sense that people can check in parts out of a library that's online and people can collaborate over the cloud using FreeCAD. But there's some discussion around that, like what's the difference between say dividing, uh, like devising FreeCAD to actually run in a cloud versus this method. So maybe Lex, you can give us the perspective on this because there's some questions that I'd like the whole community to hear about as far as the greater picture of it. Yeah, so uh, the question was, could we just take FreeCAD, put it in the cloud and Bang, we're done. Like we have, you know, we can do uh, distributed development. Um, but if you, if you think, can you, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear. You. I just muted Shane since uh, Shane was okay. some okay. background noise there. But yeah, go ahead. Uh, so if, if you think about it, like uh, if you just take FreeCAD, put it up in the cloud, all you're basically doing is having like a, a computer that a whole bunch of people can kind of cloud around, right? And they can all use it. So that doesn't give you uh, that lets multiple people work on the same part, like the same view on the screen, right, so they can work on the same area. Yeah. You can't have multiple people working on the same, on different areas of the same part. So 
that's a completely different problem, and that you can't solve by just taking free cash and putting it in the cloud. So, so, so cloud cat is different from collaborative cat. Collaborative cat is when um, when you take uh, when you can have multiple people working on the same file but different parts of it, and then later some tool can merge their changes uh -huh. and also help you to deal with uh, conflicts and all those things. So, like programmers use Git, Git on you know, GitHub and whatever. Uh, where they can all work on the same code base, and then Git will work out the conflicts and, and help you merge the code and you know, all that stuff. So there isn't currently an open source collaborative versioning slash merging or dipping tool for for FreeCAD or for any CAD as far as I know. Um, uh, and then I have uh, to, to go to the next slide. Um, uh huh. I okay. talked a little bit about kind of just to illustrate the difference. Yeah, yep, next yeah, page. Screen isn't updated. Okay, yeah, I'm on but page okay. five. So, yeah, so kind of just to kind of illustrate what are the differences between the two. Um, uh, CloudCAD, you know, the, the con of, of, of CloudCAD is that uh, because it's remote, you have to have basically a really low latency. So you're, you're using a computer somewhere else, and as you move the mouse, you want the mouse to reflect, uh, you know, on, on the remote computer. So that's a con of, of uh, uh, the other uh, a pro of it though is that when you have multiple people working in the same part, uh, working at the same screen, they can communicate, they can talk to each other, they can, uh, you know, the the merging and the changes can happen in uh, uh, in real time. Like they can discuss if one person says, "Hey, let's do it this way," and the other says, "Let's do it a different way," right? They can sort of work it out on a human level. Um, so that's a positive, but it's also a negative because then you have to have both people present in order to resolve these issues. Um, Another pro of cloud is that you just connect to online uh, service and then uh, uh, you don't have to have CAD installed locally. And actually that was, uh, if you're familiar with um, uh, what is that, the cloud CAD company, um, Onshape? Yeah. Or Onshape, yeah. So that was one of their biggest actually selling points. Is not necessarily the collaborative part, but the fact that uh, companies didn't want to purchase the really expensive licenses. And with the cloud CAD, basically just give all the employees a user you know, account, right, and they just go out to Onshape and then we need So that's actually a big pro for, for companies, commercial companies. Uh, and then a con is that obviously Onshape is a big company and you know, they have a huge infrastructure to run all of those CAD instances that people connect to. Uh, on the collaborative CAD side, because it can be asynchronous, right, so two people can work independently and then merge their code later, it can be offline have uh, really good internet, or if you don't have any internet at all, but right, you're on a plane or, or whatever, or you're in some uh, place where there's a uh, remote location, uh, so that way you can still work. Uh, the con is that in order to support this sort of workflow, you have to have a really complicated uh, merging algorithm that will take your changes and somebody else's changes and then combine them and have the combined product make sense, right? Like, you can have an automated system that combines somebody else's changes yours, but the end result is not very useful. It doesn't make sense to a human. Uh, so the, and that problem is very, very difficult. Uh, so Onshape actually has a solution to this, and, and they solve it uh, in interesting uh, ways. Like, they, you know, if you watch some of their uh, tutorials and videos, they um, uh, you can sort of get an idea of how they solve some of these problems. And it's basically for every single thing that you can change in the CAD file, they have a rule for how to resolve the, the change. So like, if one person changes the height of you know, the length of something, and another person changes the width, then it will you know handle it this way. If two people both change the length, then it will take the longest length, or it will take whichever length uh, makes sense, depending on other things. So it gets really complicated. Um, so that's that's a con of, of the collaborative count. Another pro is uh, that people can work asynchronously when they have availability. Um, Right, so it's kind of like the first one, right? If you're offline, you can still work. Uh, another con is that you have to have to install the software locally. Since we're using open source, it's not as big of a problem because we don't have to deal with licensing and all of that stuff. Uh, but you do have to have a powerful enough computer to run CAD, and it does require some significant CPU. Uh, and then another pro is it's decentralized, right? So it's as many people as want to work on it they can. There's, there's no central service. Uh, uh huh. 
Okay. Are there any questions on this? Yeah, I, I definitely have a question. So how do we resolve, like, say, okay, say, of course, with a few people working on this, you resolve the changes as you go, but as you scale, say you, you have, like, 50, you know, down the road, a few years down the road, we got a hundred people working real time on a CAD design uh, using all the different modules. How do you resolve uh, what when people check it, things in and out? So the way that Onshape does it is that, like I said, they actually implemented the algorithm to do the merging. Like, the, it, it will do whatever it thinks is the best way to merge things. And you may still end up with things that don't make sense. Uh, but I guess they came up with things that, uh, sort of rules of thumb in terms of merging. Um, the way that, uh, so once I get to the OC, that's the next slide, um, one of the ways that uh, I've, I've, been, I've been thinking about doing it in OC at Workbench, is since we have, uh, since OECs are all about modularity, we have a lot of components, like small components and small modules. Yeah. Uh, so we just, we just make it so that when you're editing something, you're editing one component or module at a time. Yeah. And then, and then basically you check out, so you lock it uh, globally. Yeah. And then you unlock it between exchanges. So that, that completely... Um, yeah. It makes it unnecessary to have the, the complicated algorithm. But it also, the downside is that you, you know, somebody could lock something and then not be working on it, right? So that's one downside. Um, and then you, you won't work on it because you think somebody else is working on it and you don't want to deal with, with uh, the chicken the merger. Uh, but I think it can still scale. If we're, you know, if OSC is really modular and we have lots of small components, then the chances of two people working on the same small component are much less. Right. Um, on the other hand, one nice thing on Onshape, and they actually support this, is you can have branches. So, like, you can take one part and implement it two ways and see which one's better and then merge the correct, the one that's chosen. So, uh, be, you know, collaborative CAD, being able to dip and merge things automatically is definitely still very, very desirable and, and something that I think we should have in the long term. But can we have... Short term, yeah. locking should work. Okay, you can lock it. Um, right. Do you see yourself doing the more advanced thing where you can have branching in the future, or no? Uh, yeah, eventually. I mean, it's all about having time. I mean, I could work on it even now, but it's, I mean, like my time is pretty limited. Right. So maybe um, just how we approach doing this, how, uh, the meta question is how do we, like, say there's another person that can work in Python, because this is you're working in Python, right? Yes. So... How can we invite others to develop, co-develop? Like, is it? Uh, can you train somebody, or can you? Is this document of how you're doing this, so so people can actually jump in? Well, part of the issue is FreeCAD itself. Um, it, you, I mean, we would need a different format. Um, yeah, it's kind of the, the problem is so big that it's not even like changing the code that I'm working on. Like, this could be solved separately, and then and then add it. I guess. Because what you're talking about is having a library that is able to receive two pre-CAD files and then tell you what differences are, but also where you can say, hey, I would like to merge them. So that, that can be worked on independently. It's not like a, um, mm -hmm. there's no dependency or anything. So somebody, yeah, cause if they want to work on that sort of thing, they can just sit down, download pre-CAD, create two files, and then start writing scripts that will open up both files and try to merge them. Or, or okay. Them. Can we have a, would it be easy to do something where you lock it, but of course people can still access that source file? I mean, they could probably still access that part that they could work on, but they couldn't insert it into the collaborative CAD. They could work on it offline, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's the idea. Is so, yeah. Uh, if you actually yeah, yeah. look at the, um, the wiki page, yeah. uh, I explain a little bit how the locking would work. Okay. Uh, but it, it, it says... Um, not intrusive as possible, where even if somebody locks it, right, but then they don't commit anything, you can, and then they unlock it later, um, you can still commit something, because, or if, if they unlock it, and then later they, they commit locks, not lock, that should still be okay as long as somebody else has it. So the locking and unlocking is just kind of a flag to tell other people, hey, I'm working on this. Uh, but if, if somebody hasn't modified the version, if you still have the latest one, then even if you didn't lock it, you should still be able to push to it. But the only thing that we care about is linear history. So we don't have to do dipping and merging. And, and you, you do that with a linear history. So if you have a linear history, then you can do it. And the way that you can enforce a linear history is just locking it up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that sounds great. Okay.
Other questions? Okay, it's excellent. That would be awesome. Tell me what's the difference between the the idea of, say we have a part library like we currently have on part library page on a wiki, and you just upload new files there to, to something that you set up as a gallery of parts. What's the difference? In the current way, can you get uh, edit conflicts? Like one person works on a file and another person works on a file and they upload it at different times? I mean, tell me how just that aspect is what's what's improved over just doing that on the wiki with a gallery? So, uh, well, if you add the lock on the gallery, so let's say you have the one file, right? And let's say I work on a file and I add something to it. Yeah. And then I, I upload the file. And then you're also at the same time working on something and then you upload it. Well, we were both able to upload it. And in a sense, it is corrupt because yeah. whoever uploaded last is the change that takes effect, but none of my work will show up in the latest version. So that's, that's kind of what yeah, so yeah, say, okay. Say if I'm working on it, I will lock it, and then when you try to save or upload or, or download even, uh, it will right. show you that, hey, Lex is working on it right now. I can, you can go ping me and say, hey, are you still working on it or not? You know, if not, then unlock it. Yeah. And then we both yeah. know that nobody's working on it. So it's kind of that control. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's understandable. Just basically get, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Because in a wiki, there is no no lock, and therefore... Two people can be, say, in a worst case scenario, you got two people like spending all this time on a certain design and they haven't uploaded and they then they upload it and they find out, oh, 
well, I've been doing this and you've been doing this without knowing. Yeah, so that, that kind of issue would be eliminated, right? Yep. Yep, okay. Well, that sounds good. Sounds good. Um, are you pretty busy these days on your other stuff, so you you don't have a lot of time to work on the workbench these days, or what's your schedule look like? Um, well, right now, I've been, I've been re-implementing Bitcoin Wallet uh, for, for the project. And so once I'm past the point where I'm like in the you know the trenches, uh, I might have more time on the weekends. Because right now, I've been literally working like seven, seven days a week. Uh, it's pretty crazy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think things will slow down probably in a week or two, uh, and I'll have more time to work on the weekends. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. So let's let's move on to uh, to Shane now with the D3D CNC circuit mill. So so excellent results from Shane on the circuit mill, which he's doing for his master's part of his master's thesis actually. So Shane, you want to take take over there? Let's see, I gotta unmute you. Yeah, I think you should be good, Shane. Uh, we can't hear you though, let's see. Still can't hear you, Shane? Shane, can you speak? We can't hear you. Oh, there you go. Uh, we can't hear you, but you're sharing your screen. Okay, that's good. Um, let's see if Shane joins us back here. Um, Can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear you now. Okay. Excellent. Alright, let me share my screen again. Yep. Uh, we want to go. Let's see, do you have a link for your stuff or this is all on. on um... Okay, okay. Because actually, it's part of it because you, you can't publish yet, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. How many parts do you have in there right now? What's that? 
How many parts do you have in the part set right now? Two hundred, okay. Uh, design which? Oh, uh, that was the D3D yeah, the free CAD. CAD yeah. No, that's that was Will. He's not on okay. a team anymore. Yeah. Drive uh, circuit board mills. They 
exist, um, but in my opinion, they're very bloated. And the, the biggest thing is, like, I, I tried to work with them initially, but if if you're, I, I'm not in, like an expert coder. I'm okay. Um, but if you don't have like a degree in computer science, a lot of open source software can be hard to modify, or you have to spend a lot of time understanding what the other person did. So. Um, so I decided to just make my own software because it's, it's really not that difficult to implement. Um, and and I'm, I'm trying to keep it as minimalist and as unbloated as possible, like I'm making it just for this application. But I'm also making it easy to modify for a new application. It's not going to out of the box be fit for every application. But it's easy to modify because I think right now it's implemented in less than a thousand lines of code. So. Um, so it's pretty easy to just go through the code and understand what function does what and where you need to put it. Um, I, I try to do things in the, like, freshman of college level programming techniques and not, like, invoking difficult things like multi-threading or any concurrent programming. You know, like that, I just you know, really try to keep it simple and easy to understand. And so, like, if you just look at this example, this, this is the behind the button, uh, like the increment Z. So you, the program has these variables, like the movement g-code command, and then it's moving the d-axis. It's getting our increment value, which are just pulls from this box here. And then here, this is bringing in the feed rate, which is pulling from that box. Um, and then here, we have like some kind of, it, what it allows you to do is you can make some scriptable uh, g-code commands, essentially where like this button, this relative send G code, uh, this is this is sending G code by first sending the G91 and G90, which so all, all relative movement is for, for those of you that aren't uh, familiar is moving from the current tool center point where your tool is at versus the the homing point where your 3D printer thinks is like a zero zero. So it's it's fairly straightforward and something that I would kind of want to attach with this is heavy commenting in the code and also um, eventually start making some YouTube videos that go through and explain uh, how, how these functions work. So it, really anybody can take can take Copper Carve and modify it for their purposes. And it all works with Marlin, so you, you should really easy, easily know to make it work with any Marlin-based system. Mm -hmm. and, and I use the software to... Um, to not only talk to the printer, but to address some problems with uh, with milling circuit boards. One of the issues is that the substrates that you use, uh, they're not going to be perfect. They're always going to be warped, uh, pretty much no matter what. And when you're when you're plunging into the copper, you're only plunging in uh, 0.1 millimeter, and often the warpage can be much less, or much greater than 0.1 millimeter. It can either be higher or lower. So if it's high, you're going to cut in too far, and if it's low, you're not going to cut in at all if you were cutting on a C equals zero line. Um, so, so this can be a big issue that can pretty much make certain boards impossible unless you, uh, unless you address it. And so, uh, so I've got I've got a automated process that goes through in, in Copper Carve. It goes through and probes points, finds the height map of, of the board, and then actually, when it goes through and cuts the circuit board, it will move the z-axis in accordance with the mesh that you measured. So it's always it's always uh, only cutting in uh, at the height that you specify. Um, so this is a this is a useful feature that really really allows you to use you know low, low quality or cheap uh, substrates and uh, just makes things a lot easier. Um, so some of the results that I've found uh, so far are effective resolution we have uh, 0.01 millimeter for X and Y, and then even even higher resolution for Z. Uh, that's because we're using slightly different motors, and I'm using the special driver. This this is a set in stone. I might change how the Z axis is layered again, and it would probably be uh, the same motors that the X axis use again. Um, and then I had to do some backlash measurements because. Uh, the backlash, um, I guess for those of you that don't know, backlash is just, uh, it's kind of a hysteresis you can consider. Like, if you move in a positive 
Uh, hold on, Shane. Did you say that you had no Y backlash or you didn't measure it? Uh, how how did that happen? I I can't explain that. I I I don't know why the other ones have this backlash, but the rest of them uh, don't. It it might be something currently in my configuration where uh, you know since it's pulled by pulled by the two belts, if the belts are slightly out of phase or something on the uh -huh. belts, I, I I don't I don't really know. Um, it, okay. It Okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, so one of the issues with some of the open source software that's out there is the backlash compensation. It, it, wouldn't, it doesn't always track uh, to compensate for backlash. You can be doing other things in the software, and it won't compensate for backlash, and, and that just doesn't make sense to me. So in, in Copper Carve, I have it set up so it always compensates for backlash. You're saying by the inertia, like the rotational inertia of the motor prevents you from going faster? test pattern. 
Shane, the advantage of those that you is that you can do the holes with the same bit. Uh, no, you don't. You don't want to use these for holes. Uh, you don't. Yeah, I mean, you you probably could, but uh, it, it would it would be it would be needless wear on these tools. Where you, you can buy you can buy like a one millimeter end mill, and and that's going to be much cheaper, and it's going to wear out much. Mm -hmm. so, so it makes much more sense to uh, just, just use these for cutting out your traces. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the, the basic status of where we're at. Um, I, I'm starting to look at, uh, you know, finalization and, uh, you know, work on the software and how to make this thing ready f uh, for a workshop or even, you know, being able to sell it as, as a kit. Um, you know, Marsha and I just recently talked, you know, one of the things I'm definitely going to have to do is take this electronics blob here and probably, you know, mount it on the back or mount it on the side. Um, so just kind of cleaning it up, maybe give it a frame of painting and uh, start doing more videos on, on how to use it. And those, those are things I post on my Open Strip Institute page. So with that, does anybody have any questions, concerns, comments, suggestions? Yeah, it's excellent. If nobody has any questions, I, I'll go forward and ask what's um, are you what's what's your schedule looking like in terms of um, are you pretty busy with other aspects of your thesis or how much time can you commit on this like in the next few few weeks? Um, what's your priorities? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And and right now we don't need the external TB66 6600 driver who just used the ramps drivers.
Uh huh. So, uh, and is that is that a workable workflow, or do we want the homing to happen sometime in the future? Uh, I think it's pretty workable. Um, it's it's not they're not really necessary. Unless you really want to like hardcore automate this machine, then yeah, it can be necessary. But uh, for everything I've done, I haven't needed end stops. And so an interesting thing that I found, uh, I think it might be some sort of bug in Marlin, is, uh, and, the, and the reason that originally prompted me to take the end stops off, is if you home the CNC, and, uh, and then you go to do leveling, the leveling will work, because the leveling essentially acts like the, the tip is an end stop, because you have to hook up a, an alligator clip wire to the, your, essentially your probe, and your, uh, and your substrate, if you, if you hold your axioms, your X, Y, and Z, it will not, uh, it will not allow the, uh, what I want to say, it won't work on the leveling, because the leveling depends on it to act like an end stop, and normally, uh, when, when the end stop is triggered, it stops motion in that direction, but after you've honed, it will it will not stop. And so when you when you start plunging downwards to see where the substrate is at, it'll detect it, but it'll just keep on pushing through it, which can be really destructive and break bits. So that's why I just made it so you can never ever hone. Um, so uh -huh. if if you if you want to bring the end stops in, you'd have to figure out the root cause of that issue and address it. Um, but for right now, I guess yeah, that's. Home. And that means changing hacking Marlin. Yeah, which is yeah, which, kind of a little sketchy. Right, which for that we would have to talk to Scott, who's the head wrangler of Marlin. Uh, without his help, I wouldn't want to dive into Marlin because that thing is pretty tricky. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, sounds good. So, and we're going to take it offline so uh, later. So we'll talk... Uh, Thursday at 2 p.m.? Would that work? Yes. Yeah, okay. Sounds good. Uh, was someone else asking something? Yeah, someone else? Yeah. I was wondering how automated the machine is, and I think previously, Copper Carver, you showed that software before. The last time I think you gave an update, it looked like you were still, you know, kind of clicking on everything and doing it very manually, and you were saying you moved the end stop. So I'm wondering how, how automatic is, like, the height mapping and all that, and uh, how integrated it is with uh, other software right now, or in what maybe your future. So, um, so right now, I kind of have it intentionally not very autonomous because since I'm still kind of debugging it, uh, I, I kind of have everything in, in separate steps. But uh, it, it should be simple once I've really got everything validated to just, just have a button that you click and it'll go through and probe and then uh, then I'll go through and cut. So, uh, so the answer is I, I've intentionally kind of left the processes disjoint for right now. Um, and, and once I've got everything validated, then yeah, it it it'll for the most part be uh, click and run. The only issue is it still it still depends on the user to have to go through and change tools. You know, when you like drill when you drill holes in it, or if you're using a you know, bigger end mill to cut out wire traces. Um, so that's that's something that I, I figured out how to tackle, but I, I don't think it would be automated, at least with this setup. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's definitely something I'm thinking about, uh, just not quite yet. Uh-huh. But that's something that you'd want to do, like definitely would it be in a roadmap for later? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And the, the uh, yeah, like a, a much more complex situation for maybe for this machine design too. Oh, uh, so I guess I guess I didn't mean true automation, but I meant all the all the processes carried out in Copper Card, having them all automated. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All happening with a, like a single click of the button. Um. So I guess the the only other thing like it, I I don't have a slide here, and I probably should for like the tool chain for developing the G code. Uh, so what happens is in KiCad, you're designing the board, and then you have to split it out to this Gerber file, and then you have to go from the Gerber file 
uh, to a software called FlagCam, which converts like the, the geometry, which is contained in the government file, to a, a cutting path. And then you take that G-code and you bring it into Copper Carve. So, um, so there are, are multiple steps there, but I just, uh, it, it's not, it's not conceivable for me to consider condensing all of that right now with just my limited programming proficiency. So it, it kind of has to be that way. Um, it would be nice if this could be like a tool that connected right into KiCad, which is, you know, open source, and you could run a mill from there, but that's a, that's a long way away, at least in terms of my work. Do you know the KiCad developers? I, I don't know any of them. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not super active on, you know, fun KiCad development. I, I just kind of treat it as an end user. Uh, yeah. It would be good to kind of get in touch with them. Yeah, definitely would want to establish contact with them. Imagine you can go from KiCad, you can hit print in KiCad. That would be pretty cool. What's the status of, like, for example, for the simple end mills that you use, is there an automatic tool change set system that they would work with, or do you have to have custom bits? Um, I, I, I don't know that for sure. I'd have to look into that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, like, if you look at this tool right here, they have, uh, they have these little plastic rings around them. Yeah. And they have that so they're always at a consistent height. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the last Midwest RepRap Festival, they had the automatic tool change for a 3D printer, where what the printer would do is it would actually pick up a different print head, so it's actually removing like the whole whole head. Not, yeah. But this was for extruders though, for different colors. So it has this very precise three-point mount system for this. But I'm sure if we think about this there would be some way to do it. I, I don't know how they do the automatic tool change for bits but um, like even with this system if you could go to a dock you know the, the s system is big enough that you can go off to a dock where you're sto storing your bits but then your chuck would have to have that uh, be able to handle that and I don't know how to do that at this point. Uh, but tell me about the the part where you're doing the the probing, can we get that through a connection that you don't have to add a probe? Like we can do that, right? Probably. Have you thought about that? Um, well, it's, it's weird. I I noticed motion consistency issues if you keep the uh, like. So normally you you have your you know copper substrate here. If you have the alligator clip still connected to the ram spread and you turn the motor on and you start cutting with that connection still there it it causes the ramps to go AWOL like it, it causes it to go a little nuts and, yeah. and by nuts I mean like skip g-code commands and move radically and it's like I really don't I think it's I think it's causing interference because uh, there must be some sort of current or something happening in the motor uh, that's trans transferring from the spindle to the tool uh, and then getting fed through the, through the end stop wire. So uh, it, it would be nice, but I'd have to figure out what's causing that issue and, and find a way to, to isolate it before, uh, yeah. before doing that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. So yeah, yeah. Well, excellent. That's that's great. Anyone else have any other questions before we move on? Along this axis, 
some cardboard and some shims and shimmed it up against this wall here so that the that the whole the whole assembly can't move within a space frame. Uh, uh, otherwise, without that, it, it can shift and move, and it causes motion and inaccuracies. So that's something that would actually be addressed with the just a few more magnets. No, they are stable. The problem with magnets was that people can't get them in. It's too hard to actually glue them in because they they're so strong that they jump out all the time. But if you glue them in properly, they're very strong. They're about like five kilograms of hold each. So yeah. it's it's pretty it's pretty significant. Like PVC pipe. It might work, but definitely. Yeah, and definitely would work if you put a stick of rebar and concrete inside the PVC. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, we'll have to experiment with that. See, see if that's any practical. Yeah. Okay. Uh,
see this being designed more modular where you can like switch the printer between, you know, 3D printing plastics and that kind of stuff and, and then using the bill head or something like that. Like I know you, you modified the, let's see, the Z-axis that uses the belt with springs. Do you also think that there's a way maybe or any advantage to using like a screw axis or maybe if it's magnets you could replace it or swap it or something like that? Well, I, I think... Uh, so, so the reason we didn't use a screw axis is that's that's something that most that's something that most of the uh, screw mills fine line are is you know they use lead screws. Uh, and Martian just didn't want to do that just because he wanted to stay consistent with the B3D system. Um, you know, which is all belt driven. Uh, so in terms of being able to convert this, it probably would be possible. You would just have to make something like. To take the to take the spindle out, all you have to do is loosen these four screws, and we can drop the spindle. Um, you need to put some sort of quick this quick connect on it. And and so yeah, you could probably put just make a simple adapter that you could put a extruder in there. Yeah. Um, an extruder driver. It would almost be a kind of a different assembly that would you know be you'd be able to clamp in between these somehow, and maybe you would sit. On this edge, I could have a uh, an outer extrusion that would sit on the edge, so you always had a consistent height. Um, yeah, there's. Uh, I think some of the future work, like once we get all these things worked out, see how you can make the interchangeability happen better. Because right now, it's you could definitely do it. Um, yeah. We we would have to refine that to to make a good interchangeability system that wouldn't compromise any performance. So it's definitely something on a. To, to go with in the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I would think oh, that the uh, advantage of like magnets would be the ability to just pull off the axes and maybe swap those if you have multiple axes with different yeah, yeah. attached and stuff like that. Definitely, definitely. Like, for example, just by putting on magnets onto the X carriage right now, you could just t take out the the spindle and put on a printing head. I mean, that's already there. We, we already have that quick connect that just simply uh, unmounts by magnets. Yeah. Yeah, as long as it, it recalibrates, no contain everything, or do you have, I guess, markers would help too? Right? Well, you don't need to, like for the 3D printer, because it's got automatic bed leveling. It does that automatically. And if, if the same were there for the uh, for the spindle for the CNC circuit mill in the future. Yeah, it would also calibrate automatically But like right now I could see if you if you don't use those four screws and instead you use all the magnetic attachment points I mean there's like three six seven eight Or ten or so magnet points you could probably If you had magnets to do the attachment that could probably work as well. I mean because with, like, say, 10 magnets on each side, that would be, like, 20 magnets times, like, 5 kilograms. That's, like, 100 kilograms of force that it could stand just with the magnets. It possibly is doable easily with the magnets. But once again, the magnets are not easy to, as we found in practice, you have to have tighter quality control to, to do those properly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, but that's exciting. That's That's all good. We'll keep evolving this. But it's like there was no open source high performance CNC circuit mill before. Now there is. <laughs> That's the good news. Um, because Shane, I mean, the idea here is we've got 10 microns as the positioning accuracy there. So, so I mean, we're doing really, really well on that. So that's it's a great start. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So let's uh, let's actually continue. Let's keep moving on here. So Shane, thank you so much, and we'll talk we'll talk on Thursday. Yeah. But yeah, right. yeah, it's excellent. Great work, and we'll continue. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, moving on here. So let's let's have um, feedback more from more people. So um, that's Shane. Ruslan, do you have any updates on your side? Okay. Uh, I wanted to correct myself. Uh, last time we were talking about creative documentation, uh -huh. documentation, and how important is the time of the reader. Uh -huh. um, and then you extended a little bit to our meeting. And uh, I think it, uh, it was.
was wrong to focus on the time, on the time of the leader, and generally. And uh, the main issue is, or oh, the main thing is not uh, that good developers. And uh, if we will uh, try to optimize uh, ourselves, it's not a good idea. Um, for example, um, if uh, someone created an instruction um, and uh, something happened. Yeah. Uh, depends on the situation. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, in certain cases this applies, may not apply in others. I mean, we have to really attach this to specific cases of what are, what's the project at hand, what are we documenting, what's the purpose, what's the framework, like are we, yeah. So I think the observations are good. You always want to respect, like you don't want to spend too much time if, you know, in some cases where, say, the documentation is going to change or it's not important enough on a critical path or something so so it really does depend on which situation um, we're in so uh, I think we could we could ground this this discussion on saying okay here's a specific case of one thing okay what do we do in that case um, Coercion doesn't work, but yeah, that's right. Um, so respect the developer's time. You know, if they want to go at it because the time is right to do some final documentation, that's great. Uh, but once again, I would say it depends on exactly what the project is and where we're at on different things. Yep.
that's why I spent a lot of time to make it short. Uh -huh. I, totally, I count how many takes I, I spent to make this short video. 20. 20 hours? Not 20 hours, 20 times I, I recorded it. Oh, uh, is that on your log? That's not on your log yet? Or that's forthcoming? Or? Is that on your log, or can I see that, or that you're in the process? Yes, uh, I, I said it, it's only two, two minutes. Uh-huh. A uh, little, little video, how you can uh, connect uh, two pies by an elbow. I can't find it on your log, is that on... Um... Can you send a link? Oh, on Mon on the April two. Okay, okay, that one. Okay. Okay, I thought you were talking about something new. Okay. Oh, it's something good. I spent a lot of time to make a very short video. Yep. But not because someone forced me. I would not appreciate it. There, there are some particular jobs, especially in the IT industry, where Yep. Yep. And I would also okay with someone will suggest me to uh, to, uh, to talk louder or faster or for the instruction because it's a uh, uh, it is a suggestion how to achieve my goal uh, my goals uh, efficiently. Not because someone don't want uh, to waste time. Um, I think uh, this is my main message um, about uh, not to optimize people. And I agree with you um, that uh, it is different from situation to situation. Yep. Yep. Right, and, and then we can, so for example, we can pull files right off, for example, the wiki, if they're stored on a wiki? I don't know. I, I think it's possible. I will start with offline version. No, uh, what? Wait, it is possible, for sure. Yeah, should be able to, yeah. Germany, uh, 
Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. So basically imagine that yeah, we have a FreeCAD interface and and the interface would simply be button. So when you say toolbar, you mean buttons, for example, on the top of the the FreeCAD interface? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right. So, so the difference here is that you're going to external files as opposed to files that are already within FreeCAD that you have as part of the workbench. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 That would be useful. So we can start making very simple workbenches for a lot of different kind of designs. So we can feed right off the part libraries they're on the wiki or wherever we store them uh, such that if we curate the wiki to have very good part libraries yeah that can integrate right within FreeCAD so that's that's great let's see what comes out of this um, where are you on so on Flamingo and the OSE piping workbench are you completed with that then so th is this the next step for you Yeah. Excellent. And then, uh, would you say that if you have that workbench completed, then what does it take for somebody to connect an OSE part library on the wiki to create a new workbench like that? How? What are the steps involved in that? Can we make it accessible to with a simple tutorial? Yeah, or is this still pretty, pretty advanced level? It is a pretty advanced level because there are some um, um, I use uh, different APIs and uh, I, I think it's uh, it's not easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that's. Uh, I, I really thought about. Uh, Right. Uh, would it suffice if a person had had experience in architecture? So basically, a uh, an architect, not a programmer, but an architect. Oh, I think uh, no. Uh, the, and the reason is, uh, by the way, uh, it just uh, my assumption. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. No, no, I was saying software architects who understand what the, all the structures that need to go into the program are. Um, in other words, you don't have to be writing code so much code as much as being able to understand what templates do, what uh, kind of like the the higher level information about the programming, like someone ca can take snippets of Arduino code and make them do stuff without really having too deep of a knowledge of say Ardu Arduino programming you know stuff like that um, okay, I was the I thought about uh, no 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 computer architects people who architect uh, okay. I think okay. I think for us in general the, the very valuable skill is getting towards like understanding the architecture of FreeCAD enough so that we know how to appro approach solving a certain problem. So that's what you're teaching us in part here about you know what's what's involved in that program. So already the video that that Steven did there's some good information there. But yeah, it's like we you know we get more involved in it over time. I hope that a lot of us get better at FreeCAD since I mean the beauty of it being open source, we can learn just about anything about it and make it do very powerful things. So that's all good. Yeah. Because uh, this is what we also do. Right, right. Okay, then in this case, uh, some experience with programming language is uh, enough, I suppose. Uh, because not even my, uh, myself, I have not that much uh, uh, experience to work with FreeCAD. It's for me. Uh, for me, the same situation, learning by doing and making a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Uh, as a novice programmer, I, I didn't agree with them. I don't think a, a workbench is probably going to be that easy to learn to program just outright either. And I haven't really looked at the libraries and all that stuff. I think <coughs> utilizing the existing classes and libraries to piece it together and put it together is complicated more than just, just learning the libraries, even if you know a little bit of programming and the, and the language. And it, even things like just the errors, like for the interpreter, like uh, Paul was saying, it, it, it compounds pretty quickly if you're not pretty familiar uh, with um, how, to, how to deal with those errors, especially with when you're working with a large uh, already existing complex library or libraries trying to build something out of existing code I think um, and I haven't really done much of that but um, the class structures seem often confusing to me 
uh, utilizing that kind of stuff. So I can see that being difficult. Um, so that I don't. I, I think I need to learn some some Python just for uh, general use and understanding things like uh, uh, FreeCAD and uh, uh, for all the other apps that use, use uh, Python. You know, on Linux is this plugin uh, creation and all that. But I don't think jumping in and making your board benches is an immediate uh, step after you know learning some Python. Yeah. Eventually, we'll we'll get there. So what's what Ruslan is doing? That's that's pretty important to get us started on that process. Is yeah, yep, yep. Um, let's see. Let's continue. So. Uh, good job, Ruslan, on, on continuing that. So that will definitely be helpful. And the idea being there that using the, the new route that you're thinking, it will be somewhat easier to generate useful uh, design capacity within FreeCAD. Is that kind of the general st concept? Yeah, yeah. In general, you're streamlining the process of how how useful design capacity can be created within FreeCAD. I don't understand the question. Uh, it's it's a statement. It's I think it's I think um, uh, I was I was asking that the difference between what you did within the when you did the piping workbench compared to this is that it I guess I guess you're saying that it's not not significantly easier to to design a workbench but once you do know how to do that go through that process then that person can work with the various libraries within uh, the OSC wiki very easily is that fair to say Right, uh, right. Once the library, the workbench is there, then people are going to be able to use that very easily, correct? Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, well... I think, uh, the, the thing is, uh, I will do this workbench, whatever happens, because yeah. people from OSD Germany need this workbench. Yep, yep. No, I, th I think it will be. Once we have well-developed part libraries, then that could be a way to design uh, variations of products, right? I mean, that's the idea. The idea is to facilitate the workflow around using part libraries, right? Yes, to, to yeah. Up, what, 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 to yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe we can integrate it in uh, 3D printer. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I'm seeing this as being universally applicable to uh, 
to a lot of different projects that we do. Uh, so it just depends how what the yeah what it how it functions and and just the devils in the details right now. If it's executed well, yeah, it could be a very very powerful tool that I think a lot of people would would use. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you modify it a little, and then you have uh, your uh, road page. Right. Uh, it's like a. Task. Right. It's like a construction set. Construction set. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Which is great. We just squared the construction set level of the pro project. That's great. Okay, let's move on though. Um, let's continue so we don't uh, take all day here. Um, but that's good. Awesome stuff. Uh, keep going on that. Let's see. Um, further reports. Uh, Josh, do you do you have something to report on? Uh, yeah. yeah I'll okay. Be, uh, try to be fairly quick. Cause yeah. Going long here. Uh, just looking at the micro track tensioner. Uh, yeah. Um, do you remember on the, uh, you know, we have the kind of the, those, that kind of rectangular frame base uh, yeah. on the motor track, and then we've got those two kind of like vertical tubes that kind of shoot up, um, and uh, then they've got the bushings that hold the shaft for the rotor arms. Um, yep. And, yeah, so, you know, we had those bushings that... Uh, going to inset in there. We basically had to cut the tip off of the, the top, whole top part of those five hole piece of tubing and uh, turn them into effectively four hole tubing and just put those bushings on there. Um, and so, yeah, I was just looking at, you know, uh, uh, working on the frame here, uh, those parts, and then, yeah, this tensioning mechanism is definitely, you know, where the biggest tweaks needed to happen uh, just because, you know, we had to move those, yeah. those vertical um, that's right. So there was, um, you know, with those bushings, are, is it so necessary that we have that full long shaft up, up top? Um, it seems, I don't know, it seems kind of overkill, and it seems like we have a shaft that has bushings that doesn't move. Um, when we could put, uh, you know, we actually want bushings for the tensioning mechanism. We want that to move up and down, so we really should have bushings there. It's kind of my thought. Um, so which ones did you want to take out? Uh, I, I basically was, I was just thinking, um, you know, because we've got that, uh, if you remember that whole kind of tensioning axis we have with the two motors on, in, on the outside, uh, with the sprockets, um, the kind of square tubes that they made, yeah. um, I was thinking might actually simplify the design a lot to just have those square tubes be like a three inch shaft or something, right? Um, that then, you know, sits vertically and you have a bushing there that then your axis moves up and down. Yeah, um, that, that could be implemented in different ways. I mean, um, I'm not sure I can comment too much without actually looking at a concept drawing here of exactly which parts you want to add and versus not. Um, can you, uh, yeah, I mean, can you draw something up as a concept drawing and then we can take a look at that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. It's good because a few parts are doing a lot of things, but it also makes it hard to change one thing. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, come up with, uh, I think a good way to communicate on the design changes is to start with very simple diagrams before going all out into FreeCAD. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. That would be good. 
but yeah there's a lot going there with the tensioning mechanism I think it's uh, acceptable the way it is of course there's modifications but yeah we'll have to see how we can improve it yeah by the way uh, so I started up the tractor uh, just yesterday the micro track because I'm actually getting really excited to use a lot of it because I have well I mean just moving stuff around like for example some garden work and cleaning up in front of the hab lab in front of the actually the workshop if you've seen the OSC workshops Facebook page I've been cleaning up uh, the front area of the workshop and elsewhere so the micro track would be actually very good to do and what I did notice as one thing right now the loader arms are not moving up and what I suspect is happening and I, I ran into a little bit of problem that at a certain point the curl of the bucket was just stopping to work I have a suspicion that it's because we're using quick couplers on every cylinder and and we did notice an artifact last year where in certain configurations when you have quick couplers under very unique conditions they actually lock up and they don't open or close they just lock like as in in a closed position so I suspect this issue that I'm seeing right now is probably something with having all the quick couplers on the cylinders so my next step was actually okay just remove those and just uh, hardwire the lines without using quick couplers until we get to the bottom of this issue so that's just one update on the latest on a micro track so it's it's um I look forward to using that uh, quite a bit though because it's uh it's a good work machine for for here. I was thinking actually as as we get this place sh sh shape shaped up um also adding a mower attachment which which I've done um like a string trimmer kind of a mower attachment that could be very good to do. It would be good though to have another uh issue there being like uh, enough power for like a nice brush hog kind of a cutting mower in the front I would probably want to put another power cube on it which I we haven't built the small one that was originally on the uh, the 32 horsepower version um, power if you look at my screen if people can see yeah the small power cube it would be actually quite interesting if um, possibly look at the getting another small power cube so we can do powered implements like like a nice sized mower on the front of the tractor so uh, um, but other than that yeah it's it's pretty good it's um, I do like everything about it it does it does work well so I'm gonna be using that and providing some more test reports as we go forward yeah okay um, um, yep yeah uh, one other thing uh, just, just mention yeah Yeah, uh, design sprint. Yeah, design jam. Are you talking about a physical meetup where we actually get a bunch of people together? Um, you know, I'd be I'd be interested in, in making it out. Uh, just to it just goes so much faster when you're looking at stuff. Okay. Kind of kind of knock that, and then also it would be good to get a nice like design sprint over a weekend or something. Like that. So, yeah, I mean. Those are all good ideas. The question is the time and effort to organize them. Um, right now, uh, on my my schedule, if we look at the critical path, let me just pull up the critical path. But I'm getting the announcement up for the immersion training and doing some of the the announcement preparation. So I'll probably be doing that this week. And and I wanted to definitely put up the the micro factory challenge, which which uh, I talked about. The cordless drill part but while we're at it why not include the full tool chain of possibly making the filament to make that cordless drill with so actually including the filament makers and the 3d printer and the actual design of the the cordless drill kind of a thing anyway that the hero x micro factory challenge still have to do that um there's a workshop that, that's in Eugene, Oregon that I'm going to do the for 3D printers and then like July and August are um, that's when we can put some things in there but it would take a bit of time to to make make uh, make things happen and Lex has already talked about 
uh, doing the basically the full chain on open source micro factory getting a few people around for like a week to get that filament maker and showing the full tool chain of now we're melting plastic using scrap and then printing for real with it uh, so we could we could think of, of, of doing something but yeah we just have to uh, get around to organize I'm certainly open to it and yeah we, we could uh, we'd have to move forward on on some organization around that um, Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, so let's maybe continue that thread maybe uh, in the future, in our future meetings. Okay. Um, so last uh, last couple of things here. So let's see. Abe, do you want to feed in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's see on my slide. Uh, I've been mostly trying to figure out uh, Uh -huh. that, that kind of it became the official version and that I looked at before and I think a lot of people were using the early daily versions of that for a while too but I hadn't it, it's changed a lot I think in the last while since I looked at it and I wasn't entirely aware of all the, the changes there and they're all, all good stuff I think they move in the right direction and, and things that we want they should should help um, you know accomplish a lot of the Did you say that they're starting on FreeCAD, the Assembly 3? Like for OSC Dev Workbench? Yeah, I knew that. I mean, how, yeah. how is the, you know, I, I think this is a developer thing, and developers will look at that and figure out how they can, uh, they're just going to 
to make sure that the, whatever is coded isn't, you know, just proprietary to open source ecology, right? Right. Yeah, so you're calling out for more more cooperation. I'm I'm all for a higher level of coordination. Yeah, yeah. And when you say proprietary to OSE, you don't mean proprietary, but I think you mean just yeah. uh, in house, right? Yeah. Yeah, in house. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, all open source. <laughs> right. Right. Well, uh, You see, what what level of overlap do you see between um, like their PDM and OSE Dev? Overlap. Uh, well, I think that I don't know that there's a lot of work yeah, on um, the. Let's see. What did I link to? I link to the resource framework project, which I think is on the FreeCAD list of major projects on uh, the FreeCAD website, and that's yeah. like a long term. Oh uh, yeah. It also talks about what people are doing now and what different people are doing. It talks about the blend swap website. Um, and then it shows some architecture huh. lamp servers and these uh, diagrams down there of how different web servers and PDM and you know, different ways you can uh, different ways I guess people look at thinking about managing that, but um, Yeah, definitely it's worth like the development roadmap. I'm glad you pointed it out for, for FreeCAD. I think I looked at it some time ago and and I didn't see or I couldn't find this thing. But yeah, I'm glad that's there. Um, resource yeah, framework, it's on their current projects list, yep. Shouldn't be too hard because I think 0.17 includes software now. Uh, 
for uh, part nesting and all that to mm-hmm. the 2D uh, hunting uh, procedures. Yeah. So there's that. And then um, see for the future, see the photogrammetry, and uh, you've got that on the room up there. And, and, and Python at some point, if I have more time, I may take more time to learn Python just to understand 3CAD and some of these tools better. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll try to integrate that, and that's one thing I guess is, is kind of me balancing out priorities and figuring out how to allocate uh, time just myself. So, yeah, um, the uh, the roadmap is constantly in flux, but I was kind of looking at that a little closer about um, what what was the next big project and when. I guess the question right now is when. Uh, see, when is the uh, power cube to do an ore chopper on that going to be critical, I guess, to have that done. It's not, a, we don't have that on the schedule right now, so so we'd have yeah. to, the idea there was like, um, that also gets into the, the controversy, that, like I'm trying to promise to say, okay, the next time we build heavy equipment, we got to have our CNC torch table, and now... The way I'm looking at it is, okay, we've got the the immersion program in September, and then after that, so so at that point we kind of stabilize the funding, the development team, where we get a few people that are doing this work f- full time. Let's say that'll be that's the outcome that's intended. But at that point, if we have a few more full time people, then we can knock out things like okay. We need to build a torch table. Well, that's an extension of the open source microfactory that now we've got at least four people with full full prototyping capacity to do. So, like, for example, I wouldn't have to be prototyping the CNC torch table here. Necessarily, we can, we can start doing that more as a team and so forth. So, but right now, uh, we don't have that on a schedule right now. And But it should go on a schedule once the design is like we're pretty clear about the design so it's um just do a good review of it and we're ready to build and we should have good instructions because we want to build it in a workshop scenario where everybody has clear instructions like the last time we built the tractor we didn't have a lot of instructionals so so definitely the perfection of the design as much as we can and 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 good instructionals on that so we so we can have an effective build Uh, but that's um, where would you say we are, like on a power cube? Um, the thing that we were aiming for was the bigger tractor. So we'd build all these all these power cubes that are now, you know, we can make sure we can fit them in this tractor. So kind of like the framework for that was building that with the big tractor. So, and it wouldn't really like if we do a workshop, it would be good to do the the power cubes and the tractor like in a in an extended workshop so that it's a really rich learning environment and and you have something to do with the, all the power cubes that we just built you know yeah um yeah with the porch table it's just we other the things up or I, I don't know if you would cut most of the parts before the workshop that kind of thing but, um, yeah and it's so it's mostly assembling the power cubes and, and the tractor and putting it all together but that could be a long workshop i, I don't know for such a big uh, I think we're pretty close in a lot of ways on the power cube. It's just some of these other hangups come along, and I think I've gotten the build materials edited quite a bit. There's some holes in there because there was a lot of stuff to remove uh, that we're replacing with simpler parts that get cut in different ways and so on. Um, but there may be some things to review that to, to make sure we get all the fittings and find the best links for. Uh, the parts too for purchasing all that and got something there now but uh, the CAD I think is kind of a it, it's kind of been a hang up just with this switch to 0.7 the way I was looking at it but uh, it doesn't it doesn't have to be uh, prioritized I can I can use uh, the old version of CAD to kind of finish it up yeah definitely use the old version let's not be switching in the middle of a project yeah I just haven't understood those yet. I was looking at this morning, but um, it, 
the files should be fairly comparable. Anytime we need to migrate parts over, we we'll just have to understand that better. So, uh, I, I think continue with 0.16. It shouldn't take too long to finish the, the CAD on that, uh, the front end. Well, I, I'm swapping out. I deleted some, some parts of plumbing, and I'm changing those plumbing parts to some different parts that are simpler. So, Constraints. I'm, I'm not sure. The other thing too with, with the CAD was that if the assembly two workbench isn't working as good anymore with the newer version, that was the other issue. And it's kind of intermittent how well it works sometimes too. So I was kind of looking at recommendations for you know piecing the parts together. Uh, besides besides using the assembly two workbench, a different workflow because it seems like that's almost necessary at some point, especially if it it becomes less usable. Um, and, and it might just be better to do it differently than with the Assembly 2 for the most part. Um, so that, that's a concern. But some of that, I think, can be done after after this test is completed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the big... Like if we talk about the tractor, the big tractor, I mean, as far as fitting all the, now you got the power cubes largely done, but fitting them into the geometry of the, the big tractor, that's like the next big thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because there's going to, yeah, and that's something, yeah, it, it, like we're getting into a lot of complexity. We do want to do a decent, pretty decent job with that in, in FreeCAD and using Flamingo or however to do the hose riding, routing in there. But that's, I think that's a, like a big, big thing to figure out before we go to the build. Now, as far as the build, like larger tractors, um, I mean, man, it would be good if we can do the next construction here using the larger tractor to do the, all the heavy earth moving work. Um, the idea is, uh, I was thinking about the infrastructure here, and we definitely want to have another workshop slash warehouse. But what I was going to do is I'm going to try to go for underground or earth sheltered largely. So a lot of earth moving. Uh, but the idea there being that, uh, first of all, I like underground housing or earth sheltered housing or workshops, which essentially, for me, the biggest value of that is the ecological integration. You're, you're going to have this massive structure, but you won't even know it's there because it's got grass growing on top. It looks like part of the environment. So I really like the biotechture aspect. I'm going to try to go for that um, when we go to the next build here. But that's where, like, imagine we could do that with our, our big tractor. That would be pretty cool. Um, so definitely there's a, there's a bootstrapping need there. So I guess the, the, so there should be a room to fit in the big tractor this year, though, right? I mean, I see, I mean, you've got, there's all kinds of stuff on the critical path there, but um, that, that, that's not that you, you think is possible, right, fitting the tractor in this year? Um, well, let, look at the, let's look at the, let's look at the thing. So, so, I mean, a lot of the preparation is going to be like working out all the micro factory stuff for September. So it could only be after, after September. Like, yeah, okay. uh, so we've got, I mean, realistically speaking, and we can, we can try for, uh, October sometime. Um, but once again, we got to make sure we got all the, all the documentation. So if we do run a workshop, it's, you know, we, we're not scrambling as far as what are people doing. Like we did the last micro track workshop, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. That means we should have plenty of, there should be plenty of time to, to really finish up the, the power given documentation that, um, so the CAD is, is more thorough. Yeah. Um, we've got tools to do a lot of that to be easier. Like, uh, there need to be more illustrations or simply, uh, guides yeah um right you think you could get down here for like a week in the summer or for october uh let's see so yeah something like that so yeah something like that i should be free in the, in the summertime um Probably July, August is, is well. Yeah, or, <laughs> July probably is. 
how many how much time do you have to work right now for a living like like what do you do it's did you say like a lot of different odd stuff or yeah i mean some ways i'm pretty free but i'm trying to do uh more in the spring here i've been busier with like more planning and seeding stuff but uh -huh. um it's mostly <laughs> trial and error um but i i think in the summer i have a lot of time to to uh, work on different uh it's usually the way it goes for, for a while um trying to do more stuff in the fall that'll so yeah yeah okay okay yeah so yes yeah, so, uh, so continue on FreeCAD 16 for for the rest of that development work there and um, let's see anything else as far as the rest of the team so John is John John are you on a team here right now um see what john put up on his his slide Roger. yep okay. uh, you mentioned about the uh, underground construction did i understand you correctly yeah yeah earth earth sheltered construction okay. yep Uh -huh. and, uh, we, we discussed with him once about building a house and he suggested uh, not to make basement at all. It just uh, expensive and uh, not very useful, something like this. Uh -huh. The problem was more, the largest problem is uh, price. Yep. Yeah, it depends. Depends what the design criteria are. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, no. That's what everybody everybody says. <laughs> it, uh, I understand, but it's uh, very general. But in this case, it's uh, it, it was his uh, suggestion. Don't uh, make uh, don't make a basement because it's too expensive. Right. Right. It's expensive to move, to move Earth. It's expensive to move Earth. Earth yeah. It depends. It's not right. Places, it's not a good idea. Right. Yeah, yes. Uh, by, by the way, this is also an important issue uh, that the, the basement will, will, uh, can be filled with water. Uh, yeah, but I'm not talking about an underground house that's underground. I'm talking about an above ground underground house. One that's. Uh, okay. okay. It's uh, like. <laughs> So yeah. first of all, we would be going into a mount into a hill, hillside. Yeah. Um, there's yeah yeah, but yeah, that's that's a little bit of a distraction for now. Let's not really get into that. Um, it is definitely more expensive in terms of moving a lot of earth. That's why nobody goes underground. But of course, you don't want to be going where there's water. You want to be going into something like a hillside where it's natural that you can, uh, where you can you ha you can have good water drainage too. So th there's a lot of lot of considerations there, uh, but it does happen, and I do think it's appropriate under certain conditions. Um, yeah. So okay. Uh, last thing. So so John John is um, he's working on. Um, on his 3D printer, he's starting to build. That's pretty good. Let's see what comes out of that. Uh, and beyond that, Michael, yeah, Michael's working on. Um, so he's finally getting into Jitsi Meet, like as Jitsi Video Bridge, where we could have scalable ability to do conferences with selective forwarding um, of information packets, such as like a whole bunch of people could, could participate without limit. Like you can have hundreds of people, only a few would speak at a time. But that would be important. As we develop the larger development workflows in design jams or online design sprints, uh, design jams and so forth. Um, yeah, 
which we'll be talking more about that, I was thinking more about how we can now as we move towards having a, a full-time team how we can really leverage that to organize larger events and in that the the video conferencing that's more than 10 people would definitely be important right now we're reduced pretty much to the hangouts jitsi jitsi scales only to like a dozen people but jitsi video bridge uh, that's another type of technology and that is open source it's available so we're working on that in the background to see if how we can make it happen uh, but yeah that's that's about all for today so uh, anything else that anyone wants wants to bring in or are we good for now had a rich and exciting meeting a lot of topics here I'm glad we covered a lot of this yeah the, I do agree like the main thread about all these tool chains that we got to co cooperate and uh, collaborate with other existing projects coordinate more because it's all about coordination how we can succeed but I do see this general trend of new tools becoming available just like the KiCad FreeCAD integration just like with Shane the circuit mill integration into the package and so forth I think really good things are happening in the non-existent world of open source hardware <laughs> Yeah. Uh, in collaboration. Yeah. Uh, with FreeCAD, we will get more publicity. Yeah. Uh, uh, for now, the uh, my work, uh, the name of my work page is OSE piping. Yeah. Okay. It has OSE on the front. Yeah. If it uh, if it will work out, it will become a good work page, and other people will use it. They maybe uh, uh, will wonder what is OSE. Right. Yeah. Uh, I've noticed when I post on the free cat forums, they, they seem to uh, know about open source ecology, other people over there. So it's uh, good to be developing stuff that everybody can use that adds back to that uh, Absolutely. community there. Because we definitely need uh, a lot better tools with free cat in general. So uh, yeah. they can do to cooperate. Uh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's good. It's good to see all this um, all this activity happening. Okay, so I think we can probably leave it at this for now and continue. And you can take a look at my... Uh, if you click on the um, Immersion Program on the first link, just to close up, uh, do provide comments if you want on the Immersion Program announcement. I'm going to be looking at getting that published in the next few days, making a video, and stuff like that. I'd like your feedback. And other than that, let's uh, meet again next week. So see you guys on Tuesday, 2 p.m., same time. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay, good meeting. Uh-huh, good meeting. Bye-bye.